We're Eternals. We came here 7,000 years ago to protect humans from the Deviants. Why didn't you guys help fight Thanos? Or any war, all the other terrible things throughout history? We were instructed not to interfere in any human conflicts unless Deviants are involved. By who? Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Metropolis Radio. Today, we are talking about Marvel's Eternals. Yes, that movie just came out this past weekend. I believe it came out November 5th of uh, 2021. And uh, now we're getting this news here that uh, Eternals domestic box office debut lowest for Marvel since 2015's Ant-Man. Marvel Studios' Eternal $71 million opening weekend domestic box office performance is Marvel's lowest since Ant-Man came out in 2015. Um, according to a new article from Deadline, Eternals is set to pull in a pull in record low, at least for Marvel, opening weekend box office numbers, second only to 2015's Ant-Man. The Paul Rudd led the Paul Rudd led film opened with seven, $57.2 million domestically, while Eternals is currently sitting at around $71 million. Many experts predicted an opening weekend for the film upwards of $80 million, similar to Doctor Strange's $85 million opening in 2016. Most recently, Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings uh, opened to just over $75 million domestically in its first three days, coming close to $95 million in total during its four-day Labor Day weekend debut. While by Marvel standards, the box office numbers for Eternals are low, the film has still performed well by other metrics. The film's global box office numbers are currently around $162 million, making it the second best opening for a film in 2021, behind F9's $163 million. Uh, for context, Shang-Chi's global weekend poll came in at around $128 million. Although Eternals' poor word of mouth and negative critical reception are likely part of the reason why the film hasn't performed as well as most of, as most of Marvel's other movies, the fact that it's not releasing in China has likely impacted box office numbers as well. For example, out of F9's $163 million opening weekend global box office revenue, $136 million of that came, came from China. Ultimately, although Eternals numbers look low by comparison to other Marvel movies, the film has performed adequately and is unlikely to impact Marvel's bottom line in any meaningful way. What seems more likely to live on in memory than, than the film's box office numbers are the film's many negative reviews and its position as the lowest rated Marvel movie ever on Rotten Tomatoes. Generally, however, it seems like audiences' opinions of Eternals are more positive than, critical, than the critical reception. We will get into that in just a minute. Uh, in the grand scheme of things, Eternals is is among severe uh, is among several recent released films to reinvigorate public interest in going to the movies. But see, here's here's the problem that they're that they're not bringing up. Uh, they're not bringing up the fact that Shang Chi also never released in China, and yet I think that movie went on to make over four hundred million dollars at the box office despite not having a Chinese release. And um, if you guys have watched my. Uh, my Hollywood and China romance video. It actually they they actually go into that with a uh, with a uh, with a uh, Chloe Zhao and how she like dissed China back in I believe 2013. I don't remember exactly. I don't remember exactly what I said. If you're watching this on YouTube, I'll probably put a card to it somewhere around here. If you're watching it on 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 BitChute, I'll pro I'll, I'll leave a link if I rem if I remember to leave a link because I know sometimes I forget. But um. Yes, yeah, so uh, they're not being entirely honest with uh, with regards to that. Is that you know, Shang Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings was a hit despite the fact not not releasing in China. And if we actually go back a few days earlier, this is as of October thirtieth. This was the Tomato Meter score at, sitting at fifty nine percent out of hundred and sixteen reviews, um, which is by far which already at that time was the low was the lowest uh tomato meter was the lowest tomato meter score of any mcu movie so what's it sitting at right now well um let me refresh the page and um as uh, as of november 8th 2021 the tomato meter score is now at 48 percent it dropped 11 points and out of 297 reviews so hold on how, how many were there uh, i can't remember 116 116 minus 297 is um ba, 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 is that a hundred and that is a hundred and eighty one a hundred and eighty one reviews later and somehow the tomato meter score goes down 
I know the audience score is showing at an 81%, but I never trust audience scores because of potential review bombing. And yes, and yes, I know people like, I, they love using the term review bombing in a negative context when people just leave a bunch of one out of five star reviews on Rotten Tomatoes. But here's the thing, review bombing can also occur in the other direction. You can drop a bunch of five out of five reviews, but somehow that's not review bombing. It's not review bombing if you leave a bunch of five out of five reviews. It's only when you leave a bunch of one out of five reviews. You know, fu funny how that works. But uh, let's jump over to uh, let's jump over to uh, to the Hollywood Reporter. These articles came out on November sixth, so just a day after the movie came out, and uh, that is uh, eternal struggles to Marvel audiences. I see, I, I see, I see what they did there. But the anyway, uh, the Temple has received the lowest audience grade of any title in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Uh, Chloe Zhao's Eternals may have trouble reaching 70 million in its domestic box office debut after earning a mediocre B cinema score from moviegoers. Well, we know now that it's upwards of I think 71 million is is what was being reported uh let me verify that yes according to a screen rant here uh yeah 71 million dollar opening weekend okay so ooh, they're they're off by just about a million Wh whatever um that's the lowest audience grade of any of the 26 tiles in the marvel cinematic universe the previous lowest was the first thor at a b plus i'm surprised that that wasn't thor the dark world at, at the lowest because the first thor movie wasn't bad thor the dark world absolutely fucking sucked uh, the rest have earned a variation of an A cinema score. Plenty of fanboys turned out on opening day to see Eternal. Surprise, surprise there. Who could have saw that one coming? You know, not even Nostra fucking Domus needs, to, you know, even, even, even Nostra Domus could have seen that. Um, plenty of fanboys turned out on opening day to see Eternal thanks to Marvel's loyal, loyal following, but the film is looking front loaded. Eternals grossed an estimated $30.7 million on Friday, including $9.5 million in Thursday previews. Box office analysts are projecting a, are pro, are projecting a weekend debut in the 67 in the 67 to 69 million range as a result of tepid exit stores. Well, as we know now, it got up to 71, but still, they were they were as close as you can get to a to a projection. No box office projections are ever truly spot on. You know, but hey, at least they got within the range of it. Uh, Eternals is, is faring better overseas, where it has grossed $38.4 million in its first three days for a global total of $69.1 million. Uh, heading into the weekend, Disney and Marvel Studios were hopeful that Eternals could hit $75 million in its North American opening and essentially match the three-day debut with Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings, despite tepid reviews. Um... I believe that late I believe later today they're gonna they're gonna probably like fudge the numbers or oh there there were a there were a few ticket sales that we didn't account for and it actually grossed 77 million. I, I'm waiting for that inevitability. I am recording this video guys um basically at seven o'clock in the morning Eastern Standard Time. So so this news could very well change. This gross could this opening weekend gross could very well change by the time this get by the time this gets uploaded. Um, at the end of this summer, Shang Chi opened to a dazzling 94.7 million dollars domestically over the four-day Labor Day weekend, including 75.4 million for the three days. The other 2021 MCU title, Black Widow, posted a three-day debut of 80.4 million, even though it was also available in the home via Disney Plus Premier Access. So Eternals is doing shitty. Um, against a movie that was available day and date, and another movie that was available theatrical only. So, I guess that really plays into the whole, you know, streaming is not the real villain to box office revenues, because if, if streaming were the, were the real villain, why did this, why did Eternals not make more money than Black Widow, despite Eternals being a theatrical only release? Um, similar to Cinema Score Grade, Eternals, po Eternals presently has the lowest Rotten Tomatoes score, 49%. Again, as of November 8th, 2021, it is now down to 48% of any MCU offering. Eternals is the third entry in, in Marvel's Phase 4. The film stars a diverse ensemble cast, including Gemma Chan, which I believe Gemma Chan was in the MCU prior. Uh, Richard Madden, Kumil Nanjiani... Uh, was that uh, Liam McHugh, Brian, uh, Brian Tyree Henry, 
uh, Lauren, R- Lauren Ridloff, Barry, Ke- uh, Barry Kogan, Don Lee, Harris Patel, Kit Harrington, Salma Hayek, and Angelina Jolie. Holy shit, that's a lot of names. To, that's a lot of names to remember. Ugh, excuse me. Um, elsewhere at the box office, Pablo Lorraine's uh, specialty beak Spencer, starring Kristen Stewart as Princess Diana, is opening in 996 theaters. The movie is on course to earn just under $2 million in its debut, underscoring the challenges facing adult skewing fair in the COVID-19 era. Neon is hopeful that Spencer will have long legs throughout award season. Stewart is expected to have a shot at the best actors, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Uh, the weekend's other new offering in theaters is Red Notice, the big-budget Netflix action comedy starring Dwayne Johnson, Ryan Reynolds, and Gal Gadot, or Gal Gadot, however the hell you pronounce her name. I've heard it pronounced both ways, so I'm just going to leave both in. Uh, the movie is debuting in more than 700 cinemas, a sizable count for a Netflix title, a week ahead of its launch on the streamer. While Netflix gives its original movies a, ber- a berth in select cinemas, the company's business model isn't focused on theatrical. Netflix doesn't report grosses, so Red Notice isn't getting much attention or theatrical marketing, despite its star-packed cast. Analysts with sources in the exhibition business believe Red Notice will open to less than a million, but those aren't official numbers. Okay, so... Okay, so basically, I know I, I know I tangented. I probably shouldn't have, um, but basically, Eternals is going to gross less money than an MCU movie that was available uh, on day and date. So yeah, for all of for all of you people that that are out there saying, "Oh, streaming is the real box office villain," yeah, fucking bite me. And I believe I did a video why you know on why streaming is not really the villain in the movie theaters versus streaming debate. So, I mean, this just this just adds more validity to that claim. But now let's jump over to this editorial re- released on the exact same day on The Hollywood Reporter, and that is why Eternals is dividing audiences. Like Zack Snyder before her, Chloe Zhao deconstructs her superheroes and forces them to question their purpose in the world through uh, through meditative and melancholy narrative beats by Richard Newby, and I'm and I'm leaving the author's name in here intentionally. Again, this is an editorial. You're gonna get a lot of a, a lot of eyes in this article. This is not me talking. This is this is Richard Newby talking in the in this editorial. Um, yeah, and another thing I can't I, I can't fucking stand is when everybody calls opinion pieces op eds. No, they're fucking editorials. Editorials are opinion pieces. Op-ed literally stands for opposite editorial. So you're going to have a lot of facts, figures, and numbers in an op-ed. In an editorial, you're going to have more, you know, more personal opinion, more, um, uh, more, more, uh, more, more personal spin, um, more rumors, so to speak. Um, but anyway, let, let's get into it before I tangent on for way too long. Um, the Marvel Cinematic Universe was shaken up this weekend with Chloe Zhao's Eternals based on Jack Kirby's epic 19-issue series, The Eternals, that came out in 1976. The film explores a group of immortal aliens as a relationship to the people of Earth and each other across millennia. Zhao, fresh off Academy Award, uh, Awards wins for Best Director and Best Picture for Nomadland, pitched her concept for the film to Marvel Studios in 2018, and the film was developed as a passion project for the filmmaker, whose previous features, Songs My... Songs My Brother Taught Me and The Writer were received were, were well received indie dramas. So it came as a surprise when Eternals opened to a divisive response, uh, evidenced by the lowest Rotten Tomatoes score for any MCU entry, 48%, uh, along with the lowest cinema score, which is a B, uh, within the same category. While audience scores on Rotten Tomatoes are significantly higher at 84%, well now it's it's down to 81%. Um, Eternals clearly isn't working for everyone, which makes the film all the more fascinating within the framework of the MCU and the ever-growing number of comic book adaptations. Now, here's where we get into the personal opinion. Uh, for what it's worth, I think Eternals is one of the best MCU entries to date and an ambitious love letter to superheroes as a modern mythology, something Jack Kirby, something Jack Kirby was innately interested in exploring later, later in his career. Again, this is not my personal opinion. I am just, this is the author's. This is an editorial. So clearly this editorial is skewed in favor of the Eternals movie. Um, largely inspired by Eric, by Eric Von Dankin's uh, Chariot of the Gods, uh, which made bold claims about alien influence on early civilizations, Kirby's Eternals was a marked shift for the creator who had defined the Fantastic Four, the Avengers, the X-Men, and most of the Marvel Universe. Eternals was Kirby's chance to do something different, separate from the larger and more familiar Marvel Universe. Within those 19 issues, Kirby not only explained the origins of life on the planet, but attributed all of humans' legends of gods and monsters to the, t- to the two cousin races, Eternals and Deviants. Zeus, Athena, Gilgamesh, Shane, Vampire, 
vampires were all stories formed around the existence of these strange beings, born of a cosmic experiment. Seeds of Kirby's work here would go on to further define Marvel and DC, but also influence sci-fi films like the Matrix trilogy. But as fondly as we may look upon Kirby's Eternals work today, this was not the case at the time. Now this part's important. Much of the pushback came from fans who either wanted the Eternals to be part of the Marvel Universe or separate from it. Kirby wasn't, wasn't keen on referencing Marvel's other ongoing titles within his book, though due to editorial demands, he compromised and introduced a handful of S.H.I.E.L.D. agents he quickly dispatched and the Hulk, albeit a cosmically powered synthetic version. As soon as the series got started, Fan leaders came in proving the title divisive among comic readers at the time. Quote, Above all, Jack Kirby's new series, The Eternals, offends me. The, fr uh, the, the frivolity in which The Eternals is written is what I am complaining about. Let's not slough over the controversial for the sake of fun, wrote one reader. I'm casting my voice for the Eternals for the, um, I'm casting my vote for the Eternals world to be outside the Marvel Universe. To soften such a radical break within within the Marvel tradition, it could be established as one of the many dimensions tangent to the Marvel Universe set another. And there were shots taken at Kirby's characterization of the Eternals, some of which have found its way into criticism of Zhao's film. Uh, quote, Jack Kirby lives in a world almost entirely devoid of such characterization as Stan Lee. His stories have no villains. Oh sure, there are, pe there are people who, who oppose the heroes, but they're never villains. Crow, who, who decades later would be voiced by Bill Skarsgård in the film, is not a villain. He is little more than bravado. Even then, readers clamored for the simplicity of dividing lines of good and evil, failing to see Kirby's purposeful depiction of the Deviants and Eternals being the, being the same except for their physical attributes, a theme which Zhao echoes and would have benefited from a larger exploration. So... So the the whole point of this is, you know, if you attempt to subvert what is good and what is evil, it doesn't really translate well. Nine times out of ten, it 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 kind of it kind of falls apart. You know, I can I can see what Jack Kirby was going for with the whole, you know, you know, deviants and, and eternals, and this is where, you know, and this was the basis of all human religions. You know, okay, fine, I can I can get that, but if you're gonna try to subvert, you know, what is good and what is evil, um, yeah, you're opening a whole can of worms on that one. Um, there were positive letters too, with some readers calling Kirby's work a masterpiece, his best work yet and one reader catching on to the shift Kirby sought to employ to comics. Quote, Eternals is different from anything I've ever, I've, I've ever read in comics. In this book, events move at a much slower pace because there is so much activity on so many levels. Again, this estimation would fit right in with a review of Zhao's films. For 19 issues in one annual, the longest any Eternals comic has run this far, uh, the, letter, the, letter, the letters pages continued in that fashion. Masterpiece or mess? That was the question at hand all the way up to uh, up until the series' cancellation. If anything, the takeaway from those letters pages is that consumers of comic book properties have always been the same, with arguments caught between a love for the familiar and the challenge of the new. Um, it's ironic that much of the criticism of Kirby's work has followed Zhao in her adaptation. Well, she did straight up say that, you know, Zack Snyder was, you know, I think, was it Zack Snyder or Denis Villeneuve? I think it was actually both. But why is it that people criticized Zack Snyder's DCEU work? It's because he tried he tried to, quote unquote, reinvent Superman by basically making Superman an emo kid, but not truly sticking to the, quote unquote, reinvention of Superman. He's still Superman in the movie. Well, Superman has to still do good because he's Superman, but, you know, instead instead of making him, you know, instead of making him the, the American Boy Scout, we're, we're going to make him this, like, goth emo kid, like, uh, whatever, man. And that and that and and that's all Zack Snyder fucking did. Um, as, a, as, a, as a comic and a film, the Eternals and Eternals and, and Eternals are works, even with their flaws, that encompass so much about what both creators think about existentialism, grand design, and individualism. Zhao has joined the ranks of Richard Donner and Zack Snyder as one of the few filmmakers to fully embrace the mythological aspects of these characters. The Snyder comparison is particularly relevant given both filmmakers' approach to the collective history of the characters explored, and Eternal shares the, shares the divisive response to, Sny to Snyder's Man of Steel and Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice released in 2016. But again, like I said, it's because he tried to reinvent Superman, and all he did was make Superman an emo goth kid, is all he fucking did. 
uh, which seemingly took a deconstructive approach to superheroes and forced them to question their purpose in the world um, through, uh, through meditative and melancholy narrative beats and a tragic yet hopeful ending. Uh, in, a, in, a re- in a recent interview with, with the French site film Octu, uh, Zhao cited Snyder as an inspiration for the film. Okay, I, 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 I wasn't misreading. Uh, particularly her take on Icarus of uh, Richard Madden, saying, quote, Of all the modern interpretations of Superman, Zack Snyder's Man of Steel inspired me the most because he approached this myth in an authentic and very real way. This film left a strong impression on me. Bull fucking shit! Okay, Zack Snyder did not, did not, you know... Uh, did not, you know, approach the myth in an authentic and very real way with fucking Superman. Because he still made Superman fucking good when Superman had no goddamn reason to be good. A perfect example of it is earlier in Man of Steel, in one of the flashbacks when he's a kid, and the school bus goes goes off the bridge and starts drowning in the fucking river, he saves the fucking school bus. Why does he save the school bus full of drowning children? Because he's fucking Superman! Despite the fact he was 12 years old, despite the fact he was 12 years old at the time. If he truly wanted to reinvent Superman, ha- have Clark Kent do something very, very, uh, very controversial. Leave the fuckers to drown. He sa- he saves himself and that's when, and that's when Jonathan Kent gets on his ass about, and that's when Jonathan Kent gets on his ass about it. But no, what does Jonathan Kent do? Well, you should, well, you should have just let the kids drown. You know, I'm 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 going off on a tangent, and I, and I don't want to give myself a, and I don't want to give myself an aneurysm here. I'm just going to move on. Um, as as myths, these characters can be monumentally flawed, and the things that we take as attributes in most of the superhero properties, responsibility, love, agelessness, and it, are explored with the weight of real consequences. Not Man of Steel. You know, quit 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 giving Zack Snyder all this fucking credit that is unearned. Uh, much like Snyder's DC films, no. Nope. Uh, Zhao's approach, Zhao, Zhao approaches superheroes differently from the black and white, good and evil morality we so, we, we so often expect of these, from these films. Do you know why they approach it from the black and white, good and evil morality? Because it fucking works. That's how stories have been told. That's how stories have been told since the beginning, since the beginning of fucking mankind. This guy is clearly good. This guy is clearly bad. Good triumph, good triumphs over evil. Okay, it's 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 every every decent story told over thousands and thousands of years has always been good versus evil. I hate to fucking break this to you. Um, by looking at superheroes as myths, they become more than wish-fulfilling entertainment. They, be, they become human, humanist experiences, representing the full swath of what it means to live as a human, to rise and fall in true, uh, in true Icarian... Uh, um, I, um, I, I know I mispronounce it, Icarian fashion. It's, uh, I think it's Icarian, uh, Icarian fashion. Um, all right, I'm, 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 I'm going to go ahead and move on. I'm, I'm about to give myself an aneurysm here. Um, uh, ba 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 ba. Um, okay, here I am. Uh, Zhao goes a step further from the norm uh, in that Eternals has no real villain. Well, there's your goddamn problem right there. You know, I, I I'm sorry. If you don't have a fucking villain to your movie, there's no goddamn point to your movie. You know, yeah. What what's the fucking point? Oh, we're gonna we're gonna truly examine what it means to be what it means to be good and what it means to be evil. You know, because I have to be I have to be some 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 cringy fucking meme or some cringy fucking edge lord on the internet over the last fifteen years, bruh. Um, characters take dark turns, betray and abandon each other, but this comes from a place of identity, who they inherently are rather than what they, rather than what they become. Xiao imagines how difficult it, it would be for beings who have existed for millennia to truly change, even when burdened with new information. The search for purpose and the inability to change course once that purpose has been found has been an element throughout all of Xiao's films, and I'd argue that despite the superpowers and action sequences, Zhao isn't out of her wheelhouse, but playing out the events of her previous films on a larger tapestry. But again, if there is no clear good versus evil, there's no point to your goddamn story. You ho- you already highlighted the problem. You know, here with this line right here. Zhao goes a step further from the norm in that Eternals has no real villain. What's the what's the point? Of the, so what so what's the story then? Please, please, if anyone has seen the movie, actually tell me in the fucking comments because. I can't see how you form a story without a villain. You know, every hero needs a villain. You know, so you know, sorry, I hate I hate to burst your fu- I heard I hate to burst your fucking bubble of Zack Snyder fucking fanboys, but every every hero needs a villain, and not every hero needs to be some some you know some fucking uh, some fucking emo kid. Um, 
even if the Eternals doesn't entirely work for all audiences, I reject the idea that it's bad or I reject the idea it's that it's a bad or a poorly made film. And actually, I'm gonna go back to my Zack Snyder comment. It wasn't entirely Zack Snyder that did it. It really goes back to Christopher Nolan. Fuck that guy too. Anyway, let's get let's get back to this editorial. Um, I'll gladly take a film that opts for a massive swing flaws included overplaying it safe. There is increasingly a sense within too much of film criticism of critics feeling like it's their job to let directors know their place and stay within the confines of expectation. Expectations are a good thing! You know, if you're going into a superhero movie, but you're making it clear that there's no villain, the heroes have no villain to fight, then there's no point to the fucking superhero movie. I hate to break this to you. You know, expectations, are, there's nothing There's nothing wrong with expectations. Now, if you set your expectations too high, a la what people did with Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace, then, yeah, you know, don't, yeah, don't set your expectations so astronomically high that not even God himself can, you know, not even, not even God himself can, can hit them, you know, but expectations are not a bad thing. Uh, we saw this with Ava DuVernay's A Wrinkle in Time, in which negative hyperbole gave critics permission to dismiss the work and its ambition. This is an issue I believe happens too often with women of color who want to make large-scale studio movies. I heard A Wrinkle in Time was not the best adaptation. Again, I never saw it because I, I have no interest and I, tr I, truly, don't rem I truly don't remember it. Uh, whether over overtly or subtextually, there are a number of scathing reviews for Eternals that look at the film as if Zhao was trying to make an Oscar drama and not having fun bringing her own sensibilities to a blockbuster. Okay, but you just said there's no villain to the Eternals and she wants to explore what is good and what is evil. How is she not trying to make fucking Oscar bait at that point? You know, you're, you're, you are you know, who is who the fuck is this author? I think it's Richard Newby. He's contradicting his own goddamn points here. Um, so many of the criticisms levied at the film are absent from what other reviews of Marvel movies that have the same inherent flaws of the genre. Why does one receive praise and another doesn't? Um, maybe because the other movies stick to the concept of black and white, good versus evil. It, it could be that goddamn simple. Uh, because Zhao has an, no, 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 because Zhao has an Oscar. There have been noteworthy directors behind the MCU. People forget Kenneth Branagh, you know, legendary fucking actor, Shakespeare, traditional Shakespearean actor, directed the first Thor movie. The first Thor movie was not that fucking bad. You had, jo you had Joss fucking, granted, none of these were Oscar winners, so I, so, so I get, I guess that they have a point, but Again, there have been very notable filmmakers behind the MCU, so don't give me this cockamamie fucking bullshit that, oh, is it because Chloe Zhao has an Oscar? Um, because Zhao is a what? quit playing the fucking race card. Because Zhao is a woman of color? Because Eternals isn't the familiar ordinary to extraordinary story? Maybe that's your goddamn problem right there. Because Eternals isn't the familiar ordinary to extraordinary story. If there's, if, if the hero doesn't have a villain to fight, there's no point to the goddamn story. Uh, is it because the film takes itself seriously and doesn't wink and invite you to laugh at what many still consider and would have only exist as merely kids content? Oh shit. Okay, I, I have to give I have to give him that point. I have to give him that point there. You know how many Marvel movies just basically want to tell a joke for the sake of telling a joke? You know, okay, I'll get I'll give I'll give you the I'll give you I'll give you that point there. But you have so many bullshit points that you know it's like you know it's like reading a um it's oh what's her name uh, Ayn Rand it's like reading an Ayn Rand novel it's like reading Fountainhead or um, what's her most famous, a Atlas Shrugged, where it's like this, these huge like 2,000 page novels. It's, it's like, it's like, ma it's like um, tapping a tree for maple syrup. Yeah, you can fill a five pound bucket, but once you boil it down and you get all the crap out of it, you get maybe about five, six ounces of actual maple syrup. So, you know, sorry, even, even if you legitimately make a point, I have to sift through so much bullshit that it's not even worth it. Um, bulk if you will, but there are implicit biases in terms of how these films are looked at according to who makes them and what they seek to add to the discussion. Okay, here's where I'm going to cut back over to Rotten Tomatoes. Let's actually look at the top critics on, on, the, on, on, on the Eternals page. I'm not looking at audience scores. I don't give a shit about those. But let's actually look at who are the top critics on Rotten Tomatoes and let and let's see what and let's see what they have to say. And again, these are the top critics 
um, accord, uh, um, these are the top critics as of November 8th, 2021. So if you try to look at these for yourself, these top critics may, may have shifted. I don't know. So let's look at Wendy, I, Wendy, Wendy Eyed uh, from The Observer in the UK. Again, rated as a top critic on Rotten Tomatoes. For all the effort that has gone into ensuring representation in the casting, the storytelling with its forced flashback and synthetic sentiment lets the whole thing down. Now let's look over at Richard Brody from The New Yorker, again, top critic. Regardless of Zhao's and Marvel's intentions, Eternals is a parade of faces without experience, a movie that reaches back and forth through history and comes back empty-handed. Now let's go to Richard Roper of the Chicago Sun-Times, again, top critic, and I do have my issues with Richard Roper, and a lot of people have had issues with him over the years. Um, this is one of the more forgettable MCU movies despite the direction of Oscar winner Chloe Zhao. Okay, he doesn't really go into it. Okay, now let's look at, I think her name is Claudia Puge. Um, I could be mispronouncing that name for, uh, from Film Week. Um, at a glacial pace of 2 hours and 37 minutes, the movie occasionally feels eternal and it sags under that weight. Now let's, now let's go over to Mark Kermode of Kermode Mayo's Film Review. Again, another top critic. Uh, I certainly can't get emotionally invested anymore. It's just a series of special effects interspersed with a bit of humor. Okay, and here is the one, the one actual positive review, but let, listen to this. Uh, Clarice Lawfrey of The Independent in the UK. Chloe Zhao puts in the full view the kind of moral quantities that Marvel's only that Marvel's only ever really danced around in the past, but there's only so much room for that kind of thought. So, essentially, what they're saying is either Chloe Zhao was way too ambitious for her own good, the movie moves at a slog fucking pace, um, the movie has a lot of setup with no payoff. Again, that could be attributed to the fact that this movie has no villain, according to this editorial. Um, what else? Um, pretty, yeah, pretty much. That's, that's basically, what, oh, and you know, too much CGI with a little bit of humor. Yeah, that's every MCU critic. Again, these are top critics on Rotten Tomatoes. And let's look at the actual critic, critic, critic consensus. Now I'm pulling the critics consensus from Screen Rant here because if I tried to pull the critics consensus from Rotten Tomatoes, it would be way too small on screen. So let's actually read this critics consensus. An ambitious superhero epic that soars as often as it strains Eternals takes the MCU in intriguing and occasionally confounding new directions. Okay, an ambitious superhero epic that soars as often as it strains. Okay, it's rather ambitious, but maybe a little too ambitious. Um, Eternals takes the MCU in intriguing and occasionally confounding new directions, aka most of what you put in this movie makes no goddamn sense. It, it, this critics consensus is a polite way of, t of saying this movie fucking sucks. You know, but again, that's what I'm inferring that, may, that maybe that's not the intent uh, behind this critics consensus, but that's what I'm that's what I'm gathering from it. Oh, man, my my throat is fucking scratchy now. But anyway, uh, let's get back to the editorial and, 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 and let's we've only got one more paragraph to go here. So, uh, OK, here we go. Uh, for as much as critics and some audiences complain that, quote, all, Mar all Marvel movies are the same. The response to Eternals is a testament to how much of these complaints are just lip service for people who crave the familiar and have no interest in interrogating the subjects of popular culture and being asked to take part in an uneasy look at what heroism means and what we truly value. I'm not disappointed by the Eternals, I'm disappointed that even with superhero movies still being the most popular form of entertainment in the world, we still fail to understand and appreciate how vast these movies can be in accordance with their source material. Eternals is an achievement. And I fear it will be too long until we see another like it. But see, here, here's the problem. You know, it's just lip service for the people who crave the familiar and have no interest in interrogating the subjects of popular culture and being asked to take a part. Not easy to look, blah, 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 blah. I'm not going to read this whole thing. Um, it's never a good idea to subvert the expectations in a, in a, in a popular franchise. You know, a popular franchise, people are going to go in with expectations, you know. You know, if you like one M if you like the MCU movies up to this point, you're probably going to like all the MCU movies going forward. That's just that's just the way it works. You know, is that you're going to go in with a set of expectations. I'm going to go into an MCU movie. But if you're walking into this, you know, fucking slog fest and you're like, what does it truly mean to be to be a superhero? And we're not going to have any villains because we have to explore this inter this internal struggle. Well, I'm saying, well, you can do that. Just don't do that in the fucking MCU. And here's another problem. And they touched on this in the in, in this article. The, the Eternals, when the comic came out, was divisive at the time. So you could definitively say 
Nobody fucking asked for an Eternals movie. But to play devil's advocate to myself here, um, you could make the you could make the claim. Well, nobody asked for a Guardians of the Galaxy movie, and yet look at how well that movie did. And you are right. If you go and you look at various lists of the rankings of all the MCU movies, let's look at where let's look at where Guardians of the Galaxy ranks. You know, so Men's Health they rank it as the sixth best MCU movie. Um, uh, according to Nerdist, it's the fourth best MCU movie. Um, according to CNET, now CNET has it at the highest, at, at the, has it at the lowest, I, I apologize, as the 12th best uh, MCU movie. The Rap has it listed as the third best Marvel movie. Uh, Rotten Tomatoes, according to Tomato Media Score, is the sixth best. Is the sixth best MCU movie. Screen Rant has it listed as the seventh best movie. And Time Magazine has it ranked as the ninth best movie. So, pretty much, the Guardians of the Galaxy is in the top ten, if not the top five, and in one case, in the top fucking three. And, huh, I wonder why. Oh, yeah, because Guardians of the Galaxy is not a fucking subversion of a superhero movie. Guardians of the Galaxy is not a fucking superhero movie. You know what Guardians of the Galaxy is? It's fucking Farscape the movie. And it's not like they went out, it's not like it's not like that they tried to hide that either. They made it very clear these people are not superheroes. There are no superpowers in, in this in this movie. It is a fucking space opera space. It is a fun space opera fun space adventure. And that's exactly what you got with Guardians of the Galaxy. What are you getting with the with, with the Eternals? What does it truly mean to be to be a superhero? Let's explore. Let let's let's deconstruct the superheroes in one of the most popular suit in one of the most popular superhero franchises on the fucking planet right now. Probably not a good idea to subvert expectations in 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 a very popular in a very popular franchise right now. Um. And if you want a perfect example, look at the state of the fucking Star Wars franchise right now after the after the Force Awakens and the Last Jedi. And I am including the Force Awakens in that too. When they when they tried to subvert fans' expectations for the sake of subverting fan expectations. How did that fucking work out? Oh, the Star Wars franchise is in a state of complete fucking disarray? Imagine my fucking shock. And guys, that's pretty much all I've got for you right now. I know I went for a long time. I'm just gonna check the time right here and holy fuck we've gone on for almost 40 minutes on just the eternals so yeah this is a great spot to end it um let me know what you guys think of of the movie eternals uh down in the comments i'm truly i'm truly curious if any of you have actually seen it or if any of you truly care to see it i'm personally not going to go out of my way to see this movie just because you know you know who the fuck are the eternals and actually before i end this video i just remembered this I remember when Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 was originally supposed to set up Phase 4, one of the movies it was supposed to set up was The Eternals. So maybe it wasn't a good idea to do The Eternals movie without the fucking setup. You know, ju just just lobbing that out there, you know, you know, people are going into it as like, who the fuck are the who the fuck are the Eternals? Well, if if James Gunn wasn't fired. Uh, from Guardians of the Galaxy Volume Three, and had that come out and introduced Phase Four, would the Eter would the Eternals movie be be in its current state? Uh, that's a that's a real woulda coulda shoulda. And also with regards to James Gunn being fired over old tweets, in my in my opinion, what goes around comes around, because he supported the firing of Roseanne Barr for you know because Roseanne Barr was being Roseanne Barr. So, yeah, what goes around comes around, that motherfucker. But anyway, guys, let, I'm going to end it right here. If you stuck around this long, thanks so much for doing so, because I know we went damn near 40 minutes. Um, if you've been following me long enough, you know I am terrible at ending these videos, so I will just see you guys uh, next time.